I've always believed the best way to understand a system is to build one, break it, and then act like the explosion was part of the plan. This is how most of my world building plans began. Not with divine clarity or strategic elegance, but with messy sketches, stubborn ideas, and the occasional late night epiphany that changed everything. Most of the time, they turned out pretty cool. But it isn't always enough to make the world truly great. And I want to change that. So in this video, I'll show you how to take your world building from something that just works to something that feels real, makes sense, and is actually fun to build in. Let's start with the foundation of this world, its core concept and goals. The goal is to create something that looks and feels like the Earth. This means that we're going to create a crust to our fictional world, similar to Earth, and then take into account the movement of tectonic plates, wind and atmosphere systems, as well as climate zones. Before we get to the actual world building, we'll start with drawing up a set of tectonic plates. I want the entire map to be surrounded by oceans. And then decide which ones are going to be oceanic and continental plates. As mentioned earlier, I also want it to be relatively easy to travel between continents. So the ratio between ocean and land masses should therefore probably end up close to 50-50. We'll figure out this when the map of tectonic plates is done. After that, we set up the movement of each plate and draw where our land masses will be based on that. This, of course, will also include marking out the deep and shallow parts of the oceans, as well as ridges and faults below water. There are several things that determine where biomes and certain climates appear in real life, and we'll attempt to take into account the most important factors here too. Warm and cold ocean currents can have a great impact on climate in a region, which is why we'll work that into our map. Same goes for wind systems. When we got all this worked out, we can finally figure out the most likely distribution and placement of the different biome regions throughout the world. This will be our final step before we start the actual building in World Painter. At the end of this video, I'll share a little sneak peek from World Painter. But for the most part, this is going to be about the steps before that. Let's find our pen and paper and get to work. We start off by drawing out the tectonic plates on a blank sheet of paper. Based on my own experience, this step gives the best result when you don't put too much thought into the exact shape of each plate. The only thing I try to keep in mind is that I make sure they are slightly different from each other, both in terms of size and shape. Before I started on this, I looked up Earth's composition of tectonic plates and used that as a source of inspiration. As you can see, I ended up with a combination of some large plates and a few medium-sized ones. If I were to do this again, I could perhaps break up some of the plates into smaller ones, but I decided to stick to this setup right here. 
Next up, I start marking out which plates are gonna be oceanic and continental plates. This is giving me a rough idea of where the main continents are going to be. And finally, tectonic movement. Each plate is given a direction or rotation. When we're done with marking out the movement of each tectonic plate, we're going to end up with plates that either move towards, alongside, or away from each other. Depending on what type of tectonic plate we're working on, plus the movement and type of plates nearby, we get different formations in the terrain. Like I mentioned earlier, I want it to be relatively easy to travel between continents. So to make that work, I've made it so that the oceanic plates between continents move toward each other, creating land masses or island groups instead of big gaps with open sea. And I forgot to mention this earlier in the video, but we're working on a world that is supposed to be 60,000 by 50,000 blocks. That means that the size of each plate is roughly somewhere between 2,000 and 6,000 blocks on average. At this point, each plate is now given a movement, and we can start to sketch out where we think the mountain ranges, ocean trenches, and rifts in the landscape will form. Instead of showing you the entire process for this, I'll jump straight to the sketch I ended up with. Then afterwards, I'll explain how I ended up there. This is the map I made based on the tectonic plate movement from the previous part. And I hear you say, Koi, how did you get to this point? This doesn't even look like the previous map. But if we take a closer look, this is actually not too far away from what we set up in part one. You see, the clue here is the tectonic plate movement and the stuff going on near the boundaries between each plate. On the boundaries between each tectonic plate, there are three types of scenarios that can occur. The first type is called a divergent plate boundary. This means that the plates move away from each other. The second type is called a convergent plate boundary. In this situation, the plates collide with each other, and as a result, one of them move below the other. The third and final type is called a transform plate boundary. This is when two plates move alongside each other. There are already plenty of good videos and tutorials on this topic, so instead of going through every scenario for each type of plate, I'll just show you a few examples from the map I just made and explain what's going on. Let's take a closer look at the map of tectonic plates again. Side by side, we can see that the main continental plates are here, but are broken up or seem to be in the process of being torn into smaller continents. Another thing we see are several areas with island groups formed out on some of the oceanic plates we made. Let's take a closer look at one of them. 24 is moving towards 25, and as a result, its crust is moving down into the mantle and rise up as volcanic islands. The result on the map is a constellation of small and medium-sized islands, probably with a few active volcanoes. In the world's beginning, before humanity set its mark upon the land, the earth was a canvas of vast plains and towering peaks. The gods and spirits, artists of ancient prowess, roamed freely, weaving stories and shaping landscapes with each footstep and whispered word.
Among these spirits was Freya, a celestial being with a voice more enchanting than any in existence. Her songs could call forth the rains, send the winds dancing, and lure the moon from behind her veil of clouds. Yet, despite her immense power, Freya felt a deep longing. She dreamt of a landscape that mirrored the ebb and flow of her melodies, a place where the earth itself echoed her every note. One evening, with the moon casting a gentle glow upon the world, Freya climbed to the highest peak. Attempting to predict and shape terrain through the lens of tectonic activity is a complex and often frustrating task. It's a slow, often painstaking process. Part science, part educated guesswork, and it rarely goes exactly as planned. What you're looking at right now is my first attempt at this. The reason why I didn't end up with this topography isn't necessarily because it wasn't realistic enough. It was a viable option. But in the end, it came down to the feel of the terrain and how well it matched the character I wanted for certain parts of the world. You see, one thing that I think is often overlooked in world building is the storytelling in it. The contours of the land, the mountains, the fractures, the quiet valleys. The rules and concepts we set up in the first part are still important, but we are still the sculptors of this process. As we become more familiar with the tools and materials at our disposal, the quality of what we create improves. Where we place our focus, what we choose to emphasize, is entirely up to us. After our previous step, we now got a rough idea of where the mountainous regions will be. Now it's time to think about something that often goes unnoticed, but shapes almost everything, wind. Winds don't just blow randomly across the world. They follow patterns driven by the sun, by pressure differences, and by the rotation of the world. We base our world in the same type of system as we see on Earth but with a twist. The atmosphere is organized into circulation cells, the Hadley, Farrell, and Polar cells, but we assume that this map is mostly on the northern part of the globe. The southern polar cell is therefore excluded from the map. With the wind systems in place, we can now take a look at the ocean currents. The arrows show the direction of each ocean current while the color indicates its temperature. Blue represents colder currents, red indicates warmer ones, and white marks those that are more neutral in temperature. 
As a rule of thumb, warm water follows the coast from the equator in the direction of the neutral current until it reaches another neutral current. Colder currents move towards the equator opposite of the warm currents. Near the polar regions, we see the same, only switched. Wind and ocean currents become especially useful once we begin placing biomes. Just like with topography, mapping out biome regions can be challenging. It's not always clear cut. What I'm doing here is more of a rough sketch, laying down broad strokes to get a general sense of what belongs where. Same goes for the oceans, although this is much easier to add because we only have three different variations. Plus the ocean currents already give us a very clear idea on how it should be. We've now built eight different maps that all will help us in the process of building our world. It took a while to put together, but this foundation will be invaluable later on. The first sections of the map are already underway. And as you can see, it's already an impressive sight. The task ahead is to take everything we've planned the maps, the sketches, the systems, and begin shaping them into real terrain. There are lots of regions that still remain, but the process is much easier now that we have a good plan. So if you like this video, I recommend to subscribe to this channel so you get the latest updates on the progress.